We are continuing our study of the book of Numbers. The portion we are studying now is called Hukot. It uh, comprises the book of Numbers, chapters 19, 20, and 21. This section, the opening sec theme of our portion, deals with ashes of the red cow, the red heather. The red heifer, these ashes were needed for ritual purification in order to, to serve in the temple. They are still needed, uh, at least theoretically. There are ways that in exceptional circumstances the temple service may be performed without the ashes of the red cow, but it's quite complicated. It's obvious to all that if these ashes were available, then the matter would be greatly simplified. And these are the laws of the Torah, and the law, Torah has to be obeyed, and this will be fulfilled. It says this is the law forever. Uh, and this, is, this theme is repeated. This law uh, is also a law that has to be always kept. And uh, anyone who reads the Bible instinctively feels that the Almighty wants to return and wants to return to the land and wants to uh, return to what it once was or what it once should have been or something uh, approximating to it. And we do the best we can with what we have uh, but uh, we haven't got everything and some of the things we haven't got include the temple and include the the the, uh, the capabilities or the preconditions, the prerequisites for performing the, the temple service. And one of the things that we need in order to perform the, the temple service is the ashes of the red cow, and perhaps we will achieve them. Perhaps we will, or perhaps we will not. Uh, these are a tradition that in the Messianic era, the ashes will be revealed, or new ashes will become available. Every now and again, in Israel, there are reports that a red cow has been uh, born. A red cow doesn't actually mean a red, a bright red in our sense. A red cow can also be brown, brownish. But every single uh, hair that it has has to be of that same color. If it has one white hair, it's a problematic. If it has two, it's already uh, disqualified. So every now and again in Israel, such... Uh, such cows are born, but after a period of time, one or other of their, of their, their hairs change and they become disqualified. There's also people in the USA who are interested in this subject, who are trying to raise whole herds of these animals and hope that one of them will, will meet all, this, all the requirements. And some, uh, some, uh, some progress has also been made in this area, but nothing uh, meeting uh, Nothing perfect has yet been achieved. Perhaps with genetic engineering we may do something. I don't know. This is other people, Temple Institute and other organizations are involved with this. This is not something that we are involved with because it does not directly con um, concern us. It does not concern our organization, Brit Am, Hebrew Nations, which is concerned with finding the Lost Ten Tribes. We find the Lost Ten Tribes. We research the whereabouts of the Lost Ten Tribes. We have found them to be predominantly in our time in amongst Western nations, amongst Western peoples. So we research the subject and we also um, bring the knowledge of uh, our findings to the attention of the public. We reveal this knowledge and we also work towards the reconciliation of uh, Judah, that is the Jewish people and the Ten Tribes of Israel. Research, revelation and reconciliation, they are the three hours of our organization, Brit Am. Hebrew nations. I, my name incidentally is Yair Davidi and I live in Jerusalem and this talk is being given to you from Jerusalem. And it says, uh, Numbers 19.10, it says, One who gathers the ashes of heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel. So we have this, I think, this uh, emphasis. This uh, statute was to exist forever. It would always be existed because we are no longer over the temple. doesn't mean that the rules are... Uh, regarding the temple, regarding uh, the offering up of sacrifices no longer exist or that they are no longer pertinent because they are, they will be reactivated, God willing. And it says this is a statute forever, these laws were given forever and they will be maintained. And uh, we also see that here in verse 19.10 he emphasizes the uh, God Almighty, in other words, in the Bible emphasizes that the stranger, the resident stranger, the foreigner who comes and lives with you and identifies with you 
is to be treated exactly the same as you, and is uh, to have both the ob same obligations and the same uh, the same liabilities and the same uh, merits, the same uh, rights as you. And then the, the ingredients for the ashes included the ashes. We had to take a red heifer and go to the Mount of Olives, which is on the hill on the mountain opposite the temple, there to uh, ritually uh, slaughter the animal and to burn it into ashes and, and also mix the ashes with water, uh, especially drawn water and, uh, and to splash it with hyssop, which is a kind of uh, aromatic weed with purple flowers, hyssop branches to splash it, to splash this water, this mixture on the person to be, um, to be purified. And we and this is the, that that is what a portion begins with. It also tells us of the death of Miriam. The name Miriam is also in the English uh, transliterations is given as Marian or Mary. There are also versions of the name Miriam. Miriam was the sister of Moses and Aaron. She was a great person. She had uh, several other names. One of the names was Ephrath, and she is uh, she is the Ephrath who is recorded as the wife of Caleb ben Yefune. In the mother of Hur, in the one Chronicles, chapter two, verse eighteen. And then we are told how Moses and Art was told to take up the rod and with his brother Aaron to speak to a rock because the people were crying out for water. They didn't have enough to drink. They were thirsty. They were dying of thirst. So Moses was told to take the rod and to go with Aaron to the rock and to speak to the rock. And water would come out of it, and the water would be sufficient to uh, alleviate the thirst of the congregation and the animals of the congregation. And this Moses was coming to speak to the rock, and it would give forth water. So he took the rod, and he was also commanded to take the rod, and but to speak. But he so he took the rod and he struck the rock, and this apparently was uh, an offence in the eyes of God Almighty, and for this he was berated. He, he was, uh, the Almighty remonstrated with him and he was punished. For this reason, he was not allowed to enter the land of Israel with the rest of the Israelites. Uh, and uh, we don't know why this was, but it could be that there is a known phenomenon in the wilderness in Sinai and in that wilderness area that sometimes there are underground, there are underground streams, underground uh, collections of water. One could say moisture of water collects within rocks. And sometimes it can uh, suddenly burst forth. This is a known phenomenon. It doesn't happen often, but it's known to happen. And by striking the rock, it um, tends more as if he was uh, striking... Uh, it could have been understood as if he was striking a known source of water, as if uh, his action was, uh, was more of a, uh, of a, of a, of a, a deed. Utilizing natural sciences, uh, a physical reality, than than a miracle, than than the commandment of God Almighty. So that is perhaps one rational. Possibly, or certainly there will be others as to why this uh, this uh, diversions, which to us seems minor, diversions of, of Moses from uh, doing what God Almighty had told him, and cured against him so, such a heavy punishment. And then we are told how the Israelites, they came to the land of the, of the king of Edom. They asked to pass through, and they, were not, uh, and they were prepared to pay. They were prepared to pay their way, to pay for whatever uh, water or damage or they might do on, in their passing through, and they would eat their own food and so on. But the king of Edom would not allow them, and so they did not do so. The Edomites were descended from Esau, or in Hebrew, Esau. Esau was a twin brother of Jacob. Jacob had been renamed uh, Israel. From uh, Israel came the twelve tribes of Israel. And from Esau also came different groups. And the Edomites, in this case, were located to the east of the land of Canaan. And it was this, this land, to the east of the land of Canaan, the Israelites wished to traverse, to get to the land of Canaan. But in addition to this, the Edomites also had contingents and enclaves, uh, uh, kingdoms of their own further to the north and to the east. There are actually 12 different Edomite nations which are parallel to the 12 
tribes of Israel. And then we are told that Aaron was uh, had to was commanded to prepare himself to pass away to die because he was destined to die in that region to the east of the Jordan and to pass over to the west side. And this is a somewhat uh, complicated uh, subject. The land of Israel stretches from the Nile to the Euphrates and it covers a good portion of the Middle East as we emphasize often. But there are uh, there are levels, levels of holiness, levels of sanctity to the land. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is something which we, may be difficult to understand, but this is the way things are. There are levels of sanctity to the land. The land which is most sanctify, sanctified, which has the highest level of holiness, is that west of the Jordan. And there's also an order of conquest. In principle, the areas west of the Jordan the priority of the areas west of the Jordan, especially the areas of Judah and Samaria, the so-called West Bank, they should be conquest. They should be conquest first of all. The priority should be put on that region, and they, they should also be settled. And after that, and after that, the other areas of the greater land of Israel can also be uh, conquered and colonized and settled. So that's the way things should go. And when they, they came in, so when they came into the land, this was uh, this priority, this uh, order of priorities was in effect to some degree. So that is why, even though they were at this stage, they're already just east of the Jordan. Uh, technically, they're already within the borders of the future promised land of Israel. But they did not think so. They did not think so. They're always trying to cross the Jordan and get into the land of Israel because the land of Israel, west of the Jordan, is the heartland of the land of Israel. First, that is the area which had to be conquered. That is the, the, the initial section, the beginning phase, the foundational base of the land of Israel. That area had to, first of all, be settled and conquered. And from there, they could spread outward and, uh, and, uh, and extend the sanctity of the land to the rest of the area. Uh, we also come across in, in a section, the, it was a plague of snakes, snakes were biting people, so uh, Moses was commanded to make a, a, bronze, uh, a bronze statue of a, of, of a snake and set it up in a bronze pole. Anyone who was bitten would look at the pole and be healed. And this uh, apparently entered Greek mythology. This uh, notion uh, entered Greek mythology. A good portion of Greek mythology is derived from the Bible, is derived from Hebraic prototypes. So one of the um, one of the aspects of Greek mythology concerns this pole, this bronze pole of, uh, with a statue of a snake on the top of it. We read that the uh, the Eskele, Eskelpion emblem of a single snake coiled around a staff has been associated with Turing since the fifth century BCE. That is the finest BCE. When Esculapius became accepted by the Greeks as a god of healing, so in about 400 BCE, uh, between 800 to 1,000 years after the, the time of Moses, the Greeks also the Greeks is not that far from the land of Israel. The Greeks also became so, uh, acquainted with the story of with the story of Moses and with the account of how he had brought about the healing of those who had been bitten by snakes by setting up a bronze pole with a snake on the top, the image of with the uh, the, the 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 form of an image at the top of it, and anyone who, had been, who was bitten would look at it, and this had become associated with healing in general. And the Greeks simply adopted it; they either adopted it directly from the Hebrews, which is because they did have contacts with the Hebrews, or they uh, received it from Phoenici from Phoenicians, from Canaanites, and from other peoples who were neighbours to the Israelites. And through uh, uh, and uh, and these these notions permeated; they were uh, assimilated. To other peoples and passed on to the, to the Greeks and became part of Western traditions in this way. And then we also told how uh, Moses led the uh, the conquest of the Amorites. The Amorites, Amorites were a Canaanite people who lived east of the Jordan. Moses defeated them and conquered them. And these people were very uh, tall, were tall and apparently strong, well-built people. Amos says. I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. See Amos verse 2 9. And uh, 
So this is what happened. And afterwards, due to their conquering this land, the land that they took from the Amorites had previously belonged to the land, the, the, the uh, to the Ammonites, the Amorites had taken it from them, and uh, now the Israelites were taking it from the Amorites and settling there. And later, the uh, king of Ammon, much much later in the time of the, of the judge named Je- Yiftach, or Yif- Jephtha, in English transliteration, uh, the king of Ammon would uh, demand this area be given back to him, and there would be a war over that. And that is the subject of our um, of our half Torah. That it was the prophetic reading for this week. Uh, Judges chapter 11 concerning Jephthah the judge and the war he fought against the children of Ammon, the descendants of Ammon who wanted, who claimed the land that Moses had taken from the Amorites as really belonging to their, to them and they went to war over it and uh, they were defeated. May uh, Hashem be with us and guide us. Thank you.